ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار we praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly and we ask allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his blessings and salutations upon the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bukhari and muslim narrated in their sahih a hadith from Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anh. He said, Baynama ana wa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kharijina min al-masjid falaqina rajulan inda saddati al-masjid. He said, while I and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were leaving the masjid, we were leaving the masjid, we saw a person standing at the entrance of the masjid. <coughs> فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَتَى السَّاعَةِ He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, when is the hour? And when that question is asked, as it could mean the watch you have on your hand, it could mean what time it is. But in the religious context, it means doomsday, right? The day of judgment, the day of reckoning, the day of recompense. It has many different days. It's the hour when خلاص, we shift from this worldly life to the life to come. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما أعددت لها قال فكأن الرجل استكان Interesting The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did not tell him when the hour was because the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم did not know and does not know when the hour is True or false? Are y'all sure? Because some will tell you he knew but he was humble out of humbleness, he wouldn't tell the people. So in other words, they say he lied to the people when they asked him, even though it's in the Qur'an. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ السَّاعَةِ أَيَّانَ مُرْسَاهَا فِيمَا أَنْتَ مِنْ ذِكْرَاهَا In spite of these ayat, we have a group of people today that say, no, 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 he knew. But out of humbleness, he wouldn't give them the answer. So he didn't know. Now he could have told them what though? If you don't know, what, what did he know, alayhi salatu wasalam? He didn't know when it will happen, but what did he know? The signs, right? Hadith Jibreel, when Jibreel asked him, عن الساعة, أخبرني عن الساعة, قال ما المسؤول عنها بأعلم من السائل, قال أخبرني عن أماراتها, tell me about its signs. He said, until the end of the hadith. We have many signs of the last day. In this particular occasion, he didn't give him that either, alayhi salatu wasalam. He shifted the man's attention to something totally different. And he asked him, what have you prepared for it? Because that's really what matters. When it is, let's say that you find out that it is uh, in 300 years from now. Or 700 years, uh, 700 years from now. So, what difference does it make? Nothing. Unless it's going to be in a week. In which case you say, okay, so I'm going to abandon everything that is worldly and spend my time in ibadah until, you know, the time comes. Maybe then, yes. Other than that, it is meaningless to know. And we knew there were many minor signs and major signs which were still not there at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So it couldn't have been near, that near back then. When he told us that this will happen to my ummah, this will happen to my ummah, these had not happened yet. But the man was what? He was kind of, yeah, he felt a little sad. Stakan, he kind of mellowed down and it's like bummed out. Not, not what he, you know, he wanted, he wanted some, some information and he felt that uh, something else was given to him. ثُمَّ قَالْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَا أَعْدَدْتُ لَهَا كَبِيرَ كَبِيرُ صَلَاةٍ وَلَا صِيَامٍ وَلَا صَدَقَ Then he said, oh Messenger of Allah, I have not prepared, I have not prepared for this sa'a a lot of salah, nor a lot of siyam, wala sadaqa, nor a lot of charity. Doesn't mean he wasn't doing any of that. But that wasn't his thing. Because some people are, are into the nawafil, mashallah, tabarakallah. They pray, eat salah, the nawafil before and after, sunan al-rawatib, 
Qiyamul Layl, Witr, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, which is the ideal situation for each one of us. And some, is, it's not necessarily their thing. They don't have that taqa, they don't have that uh, willingness, they don't have the energy, whatever the situation may be. He said, I haven't done any of that. وَلَكِنِّي أُحِبُّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ However, the only one thing I can attest to is that I love Allah and His Messenger. صلى الله عليه وسلم قال فأنت مع من أحببت So the Prophet ﷺ gave him the most beautiful answer we could ever dream about. But it is real. So our dreams have come true. He said, you are with those whom you love. Period. It is not a discouragement from engaging in the nawafil. But it highlights the fact that the aqidah and the iman which we have is more important than the ritual act of worship. Many people do a lot of active worship that is based on wrong faith, wrong aqidah, or a bid'ah. Today we see plenty of that. And we understand from this, ahadith, this hadith and other ahadith that this is not what matters in the sight of Allah. Because Allah already told us that if we love Allah, huh? what is the ayah? فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ If you love Allah, follow the Prophet ﷺ. So we get mawlid, huh? and people in the mawlid, they engage in some, some acts which display great love for the Messenger of Allah. Maybe you will watch and say, wow, I, you know, I don't do that. I did not write a poem to praise him. And I did not, you know, cry when I heard the salah upon him and the durood, and I didn't, and I didn't. And you may feel that you're doing something wrong, and that these guys actually love the Messenger of Allah more than you do. Wrong. Wrong. Because all of these are not what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, taught. We hope Allah will accept the good of everyone, and forgive the mistake of every Muslim, including ourselves. We're not here to try to nail them down now. But at the end of the day, that is no, of no value unless it is in accordance with the sunnah. So the hadith then shows us that what matters is the proper faith, the proper aqidah, loving Allah and His Messenger وسلم. Even if it's without a lot of acts of worship, it will bring about salvation. A lot of acts of worship like the Christians with the wrong aqidah is of no value. It will not benefit on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So what is the good news? Uh, what is the good news for us in this particular hadith? That uh, we love our salaf. And we are not like them. Hands down. Unless someone here would like to um, claim and prove otherwise. That we are at the level of the righteous predecessors and their taqwa and their uh, righteousness, and their character, and their moral behavior, and their fear of Allah, reliance upon Allah, and the list goes on. We are nowhere near. Nowadays, in fact, as time goes by, we get farther from what they were upon. And so just like the hadith, we're not like them, but we claim that we love them. And so we hope Allah Azza wa Jal will place us with them. Because the hadith says, فَإِنَّكَ مَعْمَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ Do you love the Messenger of Allah Wasallam? Yes. Do you try to follow the Sunnah and avoid bid'ah as much as possible? Yes. Do you love Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman Ali? Of course. These are the people we love. We don't have, mind you, versus other people who love certain Sahaba and hate some other Sahaba, which is, which is insane. It's an insane idea for you to even have an issue with the Sahabi. No matter who he is, no matter what mistake he made, that's a sahabi, that's the companion of the message of Allah, who sacrificed so much versus what we do today. Who are you to hate him? Some, some Joe, you know, 1400 years later, you have the nerve to hate a sahabi. But we have these people today, who claim to be the followers of the messenger of Allah, والسلام, and the ones who love his, his uh, family, and the ones who defend his honor, and the whole, you know, nine yards. And it's all a bunch of lies. So we love the salaf, but we're not them. However, we hope that this love for them will bring about the uh, companionship of these individuals 
in the life to come. وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيزٍ And this is not too difficult for Allah. Is it? Is anything too difficult for Allah? A man who had sinned so much that he told his children after he dies to burn his body into ashes. You know the hadith? Huh? He said, burn my body until it's ashes and then throw it in the ocean because if Allah were to get a hold of me, then, he, then I would be in trouble. According to the ulama, for you to say that, this is kufr. Because you're saying, if Allah were to, as if you're saying, this will make me avoid Allah's recompense and reckoning, which is a critical, fatal error. Yet, the hadith mentions that Allah Azza wa Jal, after that happened, He brought him back as He was, and He told him, what made you do this? He said, fear of you. He said, قَدْ غَفَرْتُ لك, I have forgiven you. So even though I had an error in Aqidah there, in this regard, the, the scholars explain that his issue was a misunderstanding. While his faith in Allah, his fear of Allah is what brought about this type of statement. Not that he doubted that Allah will bring him back together. He knows Allah is able to do all things. Otherwise, he wouldn't do this. So we see then from these ahadith that this is what it boils down to. So when we speak about the Salaf, there are a lot of areas to cover. And this is why we will have a series of lectures, insha'Allah ta'ala, titled The Golden Chains. Because we would like to highlight who they were, how they were, so that we can make in a nice attempt, and with Allah lies success, to emulate them. Try to be like them. Not just by claiming the name, Huh? Because that's the easiest thing in the world. Oh yeah! Bam! I'm one of those. And then, in real life, are you kidding me? Like, really? Come on. That's a very fancy title. It's nice to have it. But living up to it is what really matters. And, and, and nowadays, this is where the challenge is. How many people live up to that name? If you think that the name is fine, based on the opinion of some scholars... We're not going to fight over this issue. It's open for discussion. But how many people are like the Salaf? This is the challenge that we will try to address. So, whenever we discuss anything, we always begin with what? In Islam, in Da'wah, when you have so many topics to cover, what would be the logical thing to begin with? Aqidah. Tawheed, sah? You know, we can speak about the Salaf's character, right? The Salaf's compassion. Uh, the Salaf's, you know, uh, how they dealt with business transactions. How they dealt with their spouses. And the list goes on. But we would like to begin with what? Their belief. Not the academic discussion of who Allah is and their beliefs and names and attributes. I think that has been covered in plenty of lectures. And we should all be on the same page. At least those who have frequently attended these lectures, we should be on the same page. Sah? We have the lecture, do you really know him? Right? We have the lecture, where's Allah? We have a bunch of lectures that address the names and attributes of Allah according to the Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah and the Salaf al-Salih. We are referring to other aspects of Tawheed. When we look at Tawheed, we look at that. What else do we, what else falls under Tawheed as a title? In terms of the Slave with Allah. The relationship between the slave and Allah. Okay, I believe Allah is above the throne. Right? I believe Allah Azza wa Jal is all-knowing, almighty, all-wise, all-capable. No issue. Sah? Tayyib. And what else falls under aqidah, under tawheed? Surely iman. That's, that's all iman. They're, they're interchangeable in this, in this context. Synonymous. Mm -mm. Yeah, what does that mean? Uluhiyya tayyib, what does that mean? Okay. Okay. What is worship? Come on guys, wake up. I know it's, oh, you don't have to wake up, it's late at night. You're up already. Yes, dua. Which is what? Fear of Allah, love of Allah, reliance upon Allah. How many times you said these are what? It's part of Tawheed. It's part of a person's tawheed. A person who relies on the insurance company 
is not like a person who relies on Allah. A person who fears his boss is not like a person who fears Allah. When there's a conflict between both orders, Allah's order and the boss's order. Two employees can receive two orders each from his mudir. One will tell him, well, sorry, it conflicts with the order of Allah, so see you later. And the other one will say, well, yeah, ah, uh, and he will do it. Tawheed, this is Tawheed. This is Tawheed. It, this, is where tawheed this is where we know where is that level relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal. Now the Salaf struck the greatest example in this regard. Like it's, it's something beyond belief, almost beyond belief. <clears throat> and so allow me to begin with an interesting, interesting story, which some of you might have heard while others have not heard. And this story is narrated in both Bukhari and Muslim in their Sahih. And uh, it's from the Hadith of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu wa arda. And I'm going to just say it in English right away to cut through the chase and to, to save time rather than reading the Arabic and translating to English. I think all of you speak English, right? Because I've said this before. I said, who doesn't speak English? Raise your hand. And then the dude raises his hand. So I just spoke in English, man. You just understood what I said. It's like, oh, wait. So I said, khalas, man, forget it. We both got confused and everybody went his own way. Anyways, don't tell this to anyone. So anyways, the hadith of Abu Huraira, he said that a man from Bani Israel, and the Prophet ﷺ would, would narrate these stories from Bani Israel huh, to the Sahaba for entertainment or for uh, the, the moral behind the story. There's a moral behind the story. But human beings like stories. It's a natural, don't worry. Don't freak out. Now if, you, if all you do is story tell, we have an issue. But if, if it's part of the things which bring about a benefit, then alhamdulillah. He said a man from Bani Israel uh, went to another from among his people and tribe and he borrowed from him 1,000 dinar. Okay? I don't know how much that is in reals right now. I don't work for a currency exchange center. And uh, he wanted to trade. He borrowed some money. We spoke about debt you know, in the last lecture, right? You cannot afford it. And he wanted to go into the sea and trade. Use this money for business and to make more money and so on and so forth. So when the... Uh, wait, did I skip it? Oh no, I didn't. Okay. So when the time... So the man went to him and said, lend me... He, he had decided to do this and he said, lend me 1,000 dinar in order to use it for... Business. The man said to him, bring me a, a person who can guarantee this transaction. A kafil. Someone that you know can say, like an endorsement. I don't know what they call it, a grantor or guarantor or something, something like that. Yeah, you guys are the experts in the mashallah, tabarakallah, businessman, adil. Anyways, so you bring someone who, yani, he gets you iqama nowadays and makes sure that you're, you know, halal and, and lawful and everything and then, he allows this transaction to happen. He told him, Kafa billahi kafila. Allah is sufficient as one who guarantees this transaction. So the man said to him, Okay, then get me at least some witnesses. I'm going to lend you 1,000 dinars. I could give it to you, and then 10 minutes later, it's like, Who are you? You didn't give me any money. It's like, Hey, if you, and that's why it's from the, from, it's recommended in Islam. Some scholars say it's obligatory, some say it's recommended that you write down debt. And that you, you, know, you have it written down and you have witnesses. I borrowed 500 riyals from Fulan. Because that Fulan can take the 500 riyals and completely forget. And sometimes you're too shy to ask for your money back. And sometimes you ask for your money back, it's like, what? I paid you the money back a long time ago. And you're like, did you? No, you didn't. Then the relationship is gone. Over 500 riyals. Sometimes it's 5 riyals. Human beings are funny. So he said, bring me a, a witness. He said, kafa billahi. Shahida, Allah is sufficient as a witness. He told him, Sadaq, you have said the truth. So then, the man, uh, he took the thousand dinar and he went into the ocean and started you know, dealing with it and they had agreed on a particular time to pay him back. Alaykum salam. The time for payback came. However, the man was still stuck in the middle of the sea with, with uh, high waves and storms and what have you. 
and he has no means now to return to the shore because he had an appointment with the man. I'll meet you on this day at this time, you know, at the shore. The man is sitting there waiting for him to bring the money and the dude is stuck in the middle of the sea. He cannot bring the money over. So what he did was he got a piece of wood, very nice. Here goes a whole chair. Just leave it down there, don't try to fix it right now, otherwise we're going to spend the lecture fixing a chair. So he got a, a, a wood, a piece of wood. I lost the spot. Now, and he emptied it out, and he put the money in there, and then he stood and he threw it into the ocean. And he said, Oh Allah, you know, I have borrowed this money from this guy and I intended to pay him back. Not trying to be funny, not trying to take the money. But I have no means to get to him. And I have made you kafil and shaheed over this day. So oh Allah, khalas, the matter is in your hands. And he basically somehow it should be delivered to the man who's waiting for him at the shore. So while the man was standing there, this is in Bukhari Muslim. So he won't again, for those who are watching the lecture suddenly. Huh? This is not from my imagination. So the man was still standing there at the shore, waiting for the, a ship or a boat or whatever to come with the, the guy and the money. However, he didn't find anything. What he did find was that, that piece of wood, what is it, a log? Yeah. So he said, hey, yeah, I mean, I'll take it and burn it at home and use it to warm myself and my family. He didn't know that his money was in there. He just thought this is at least something that came in the sea. The guy didn't come with my money, but something else came, yalla. I'll take it and go with it. So he went back home and he brought it with him. And as soon as he opened it, that sack of 1,000 dinar fell out of that particular log. And uh, he took the money. Now, wait, I just want to, I, I don't want to miss anything. Now, and so basically it said from Fulan to Fulan, he told him, he wrote a letter, he said, this is from me, the son of such and such, and the uh, waves have come in between me and you, and I was not able to send the money, so he told him what he did, and the very letter. Then, while he was there, the man eventually found a boat to go. So he brought with him what? Another thousand dinars, because he was trading, he made money, he brought with him another thousand dinars, because when he sent it in the ocean, was he sure or he wasn't sure he was going to get there? Allahu Alam. Sah? What are the probability that you send your money? Don't try this at home. Huh? Especially if you don't have the aqidah of the salaf. You borrow money from someone and say, khalas, you just go in the middle of the sea, akhi, I'm just going to send it to you on one of these remote control boats, yani. And hopefully I will find you somehow in the middle of the sea with no GPS. Don't try this. And then you lose your money. So, uh, so he, he finally met him, and he said, here's your money. So the guy was shocked. He said, did you not already, did you not send this? So both of them didn't know. The guy could have lied to him and said, I didn't get any money from you, give it back. And the man told him that I had actually sent the money already. And so the, the man refused to take the money again from him. He could have tricked him and taken 2,000 dinars. But... The lesson which we learn from this story is that Allah Azza wa Jal, because of the iman of this man, his aqidah in Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah delivered this particular log to this man who was waiting at the shore in order for, because he said that Allah is the shaheed and the kafir over this particular transaction. So Abu Huraira said, when uh, we would always differ, discuss, when, we, when we discuss this hadith, we would differ who had stronger iman. The one who believed in Allah so much that Allah won't waste his effort, that Allah will deliver the money, or the one who was more trustworthy. Because he could have told him, what money you sent? What log? I didn't get anything. Give me the thousand dinars. He had more faith. He said, Allah already, already delivered on your behalf. I already received it. Don't give me any more money. So this is a story that shows you what? Tawakkul on Allah Azza wa Jal. How much of that do we have today? I thought so. Almost none. Not even near. But this is how they were. 
And this is from Bani Israel, who, who were before the Prophet ﷺ, and who had stronger Iman? The followers of the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad, or the followers of Musa or Isa? The best Ummah is the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. So the Sahaba were even superior in faith, right? When the warfare came and they came and said, Inna nasa qad, huh? The people have gathered against you. فخشوهم. So what did they say? Did they, did they fear them? They said, Hasbun Allah, Wanamal Wakil. They did not fear anyone. They had this reliance upon Allah Azza wa Jal. This is also highlighted from the Sahaba and the story of Ka'b ibn Malik. We all know in the Ghazwa of Tabuk that Ka'b ibn Malik, he did not attend this war even though he had no excuse. There was no valid excuse for Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu wa arda. So when the Prophet ﷺ came back to Medina, huh? all of the munafiqeen started showing up, each one of them telling him a story. Oh Messenger of Allah, my wife, oh Messenger of Allah, my, my mother-in-law, each one was coming with a story, an excuse as to why he did not join the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And the Prophet ﷺ would what? Would accept whatever they were saying. They would tell him a story, he would not negotiate with them. Until the, ter- the turn of Ka'b ibn Malik came. And he said, Utitu Jadalan, I was very well versed in arguing. He was very good with being able to give and take and explain himself. And ex- you know, some people are slick like that. Even when they're in trouble, they get themselves out of trouble. So he could have easily been even more slick than the Munafiqeen in uh, justifying why he didn't show up. But he knew that. Uh, he said to the Messenger of Allah, he said, look, uh, he said, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I had never been stronger, yani, I had never been stronger nor more ready than that day. Yani, I was fully ready, fully equipped to go. Uh, I have no excuse. Khalas. So what did the Prophet ﷺ say as a comment? Amma hadha فَقَدْ صدق. This man has said the truth because he knew that the previous ones were lying but he wouldn't argue with them. He would let them مُنَافِقِينَ مُنَافِقِينَ إِنَّ مُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ It will be in the lowest level of the hellfire. As for Ka'b ibn Malik, he said this man has said the truth. So what was, what was the aqeedah of Ka'b? رضي الله عنه. He could have lied to the Messenger of Allah but who did he believe in ultimately? Allah. And will Allah inform the Prophet ﷺ through the wahi? He will. That all these are liars, including Ka'b ibn Malik. But Ka'b ibn Malik had a relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal, which, it, which he did not want to ruin. And therefore, his belief in Allah Azza wa Jal, his trust in Allah, made him say to the face of the Messenger of Allah, I was ready, I was strong, I have no excuse, yet I did not show up. And, and join you whatsoever. So this is a, an example from the Sahaba. Nowadays, how much of that do we do? We twist and turn and go up and down and we go around, we go all types of stuff in order to run away from things which we know that ultimately even if we're able to trick the people, Allah Azza wa Jal knows. So we need to build up this relationship where we think about Allah Azza wa Jal, even if we made a mistake, even if we have issues, we have to think that ultimately we will stand before Allah Azza wa Jal. So whatever we can get away with the people, that's not going to benefit. Now with the Messenger of Allah alayhi salam, he could have known back then. Now, no one will know, right? You will probably get away with it. I will get away with it. But we have to remember that this aqidah that the Salaf had, that the Sahaba had, is what brings about salvation and is what made them who they were. Another interesting story was with Khalid ibn al-Walid and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu, radiyallahu anhuma. And Khalid, you all know the, at some point, the expansion of the Muslim, you know, Muslim, Muslims among the other empires and so on and so forth, they were dominating. And it was all at the hands of who? Khalid ibn al-Walid. Because he, he was a massive warrior. So what happened was, uh, Umar... Anhu, when he became the Khalifa, he removed him from that position. It's a very odd thing to do. This is a man who is in leadership. So he went to him and said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, why have you removed me? 
He said, Wallahi, I love you. He told him again, why have you removed me? He said, Wallahi, I love you. Twice. A third time, why have you removed me? He said, Wallahi, I love you. Then he told him, look, Ibn al-Walid, because his name was Khadr al-Walid. The only reason why I removed you is that I was afraid that the people, you would become a fitna for the people because of how much you sacrifice in the cause of Allah. Meaning the people start thinking it's because of Khalid ibn walid the Muslims are dominating, the Muslims are victorious. So that their reliance or their trust in him as an individual would become superior to their trust that Allah Azza wa is the one who brings about victory. So he removed them in order to protect Khalid ibn walid himself and to protect the Muslims from the fitna which may come about from this. And then, obviously, the situation was resolved. But that shows you the level of sensitivity they had. And we know that, and nowadays, if we were to apply this to what we see during Umrah and what we see during Hajj and all of the bid'ah that the people have done and, and you know, the locations which they have glorified, you, you, how can a Muslim go to a masjid that has a, a darga, a darih, a dead man with some, you know, shabak, these... Uh, whatever you call them, yeah, some sort of cage, and, and people hanging things and touching it, and it's, it's, it's wild. What happens is wild. Sometimes the same behavior you see in Kaaba and Maqam Ibrahim, they, they have to have a dedicated soldier who tells everybody just to move away. Khalas, you see the footsteps, you know, the, you, the, the footprints, and you move on. The people think that there's a special blessing there. So many things that make the people rely on these items, which is a very sensitive door of shirk the Sahaba were very careful about. When they saw that this could potentially lead to something that will make the people divert from reliance upon Allah, from love of Allah, they would remove it out of the way completely. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ would be sensitive with the choice of words of the Sahaba. Huh? That one of them would say, you know, uh, whatever, I, I rely upon Allah and you. You know, something of the sort. And the Prophet ﷺ would say, did you make me a rival with Allah? You know? MashaAllah wa shi'it. Whatever Allah wills and you will. He said, Did you make me a rival with Allah? Bal MashaAllah wahda. Rather say, Whatever Allah alone wills. Even though you have a Mashiach. Now, when you go to someone, does he have a will or not? He has a will to help you or not help you. This is a very sensitive area we have to understand and raise our children in the same manner. Part of the, uh, part of the aqidah of Tawheed, obviously, when we speak about fear of Allah, we speak about the love of Allah Azza wa Jal. We know we have to speak about how much dedication uh, the Salaf used to exert in ibadah and how much sincerity they had. Something that is really, يعني, when you read it, you, you look at yourself and say, what am I doing here? You know what I mean? Like how far can we be from what they were upon? Um, Abdurrahman bin Abi Layla used to pray at night and then if someone felt, if someone sent you know had a, uh, uh, heard some some noise and were to enter upon him he would lie down on the bed and pretend to be sleeping so much so that the people would go in and say this guy never stops sleeping he is always sleeping and the truth is that he is praying but when the people come in he jumps into bed because he does not want them to know that he is spending the night in prayer nowadays people tell you well brother last night it was excellent I finally got the 13 rak'at of Qiyamul Layl. That's not very much like the Salaf, Akhi. What's the benefit behind nothing? Just telling you that's an achievement, it's a milestone in my life, and the next target, inshallah, is 15. Barakallahu feek. Thank you for telling me, Akhi. I feel much better about everything right now. And as for your deeds, Allahu A'lam where they have gone. Because uh, if you're just saying this in order to uh, be appreciated or praised, then you can forget about it. We should know this very clearly. Huh? Seeking praise uh, uh, or admiration when it comes to these issues will render the deed of no value. Zero. After all the effort someone exerted to get the deed, then they just throw it down the trash. Ruin it. So someone can say, MashaAllah. And that MashaAllah is not going to help them not, neither now nor on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Al-Muhim. Al-A'mash said, Ibrahim al-Nakha'i, or al-Nakha'i, used to read the Mus'haf. And a man entered upon him, he would hide the Mus'haf. Why you hide the Mus'haf? He said, 
I don't want this guy to every time he walks in, he thinks I'm reading Quran the whole day. Every hour he enters, he sees me with the Quran, he will think too good of me. Right? This is something we need to think about. Allah understands, especially those involved in da'wah. Abdullah ibn Muhayyir, he went to a, a, a bagala, if we may call it, dukkan, or a store to buy a garment. So the man recognized him. This is, you know, the sheikh. This is the, the special guy. So he wanted to give him a, a, a good treatment, a special treatment. He became mad. He told him, we buy this stuff with our money, not with our deen. Ouch. Yeah? Allah musta'an. Uh, Al-Matr ibn Abdullah, he said, Oh Allah, I seek forgiveness from you for that which I claimed was for your countenance, for your face, meaning I was sincere in it, and you know what came into my heart afterwards. Huh? Another one of them, he would be speaking about the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and then he would be forced to cry, and then he would say how bad the flu is. What a bad flu. And distract the people that he's sick. And this is why his eyes may be tearing or he's not able to, you know, speak properly because of the flu. Not that he was actually out of the fear of Allah or the love of Allah or the love of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Hassan al-Basri said, A man used to have memorized the Quran and no one would know. From among them, a person would memorize the whole Qur'an, no one would know. Now you have to be called Hafiz. Aywa. Ala tool. The first title, you get Hafiz. You have to add the Hafiz first, otherwise you're insulting him and his intelligence and his skills. And another man would have accumulated a lot of fiqh, meaning he attained a lot of knowledge. And no one would even feel it. No one would even know from among the people. And another one would pray for a long time with visitors, guests coming over and they would not know about it because they were always keen on doing these deeds in secret, not in public. Let me uh, tell you another one. This man named by Shaqiq ibn Salam, Salam rahimahullah, he used to pray in his home and he would cry, he would cry to the extent, so much, even if someone would give him the whole world so no one would see him, he would be willing, he would not want anyone to see him. Yani he, he would hide it completely. Some of them, they never saw them praying in nafila in the masjid. Some of them were never seen praying in nafila. Now we're not saying that don't pray the nafila at all now, because that may be a, another trick of the shaitan. But that's how keen they were on hiding their deeds that they would try to do as much, as many of them as, as secretive as possible. And we know, we've mentioned before, the sunnah is to pray the nafila at home. When possible, when possible. The sunnah is to pray the nafila, the volunteer prayer at home. So because there's more khushu in it, you're not in a masjid with people walking around you. This is assuming that one of us is praying properly by keeping his eyes on the place of sujood. Because we have people who pray and watch. Simultaneously, he's praying and he's looking at everyone at the same time. And then you look him in the eye and he looks you back in the eye. <laughs> I don't know how many times it happened to you, but it happens to me a lot. I'm like, dude, I was like, seriously, he's almost about to go like this. Yeah, what's your problem, man? Ma'alesh, yani ya sheikh. Yani enta, what do you want? Ayy salah hadi, yani. If we're looking at the place of sujood, we all know our mind is somewhere else. Keep it real. How difficult is it to, to concentrate and attain khushur? How about when your eye is looking? No way on earth. No way that you're actually realizing what you're saying. When you're inspecting another human being in a masjid. So that tells you where the salaf were and where we are today. Dawood bin Abi Hind. When they described him, he said, for 40 years, he was fasting without his wife and children knowing. 40 years. How is that? They give him, his wife would give him his lunch, huh? In the morning. 
So he would go and give it as a sadaqa. And then he would come back at night while he was fasting and break his fast while his wife thinks that she just served him dinner. And she never knew that he gave away the lunch as a sadaqa and he was fasting the whole day. <laughs> wow! Which one of us can say this about himself and his wife today? Aoun ibn Abdullah said, if you give him a ski and something, you should say to him, and he says to him, he says to you, Barakallah feek. No, you say to him, Barakallah feek. So that your sadaqa is sincere. Because sometimes you feel superior. You're the one giving him, so you expect from him a lot of, you know, words of praise and appreciation. And, and you may, a person may look down upon the one whom he's giving. Whereas it's contrary to that. Make that person feel like he's doing you a favor by accepting the sadaqah from you. And again, a quick reminder, never, look, I don't know where you eat, and you don't have to tell me, obviously, but never leave food behind. Wallahi, it's the easiest thing in the world. It's amazing how, how when you go to a restaurant and you pay 30, 40 riyals for the lunch or dinner, part of that money, the, comp, the, the restaurant uses to buy all types of, you know, uh, uh, containers for takeaway. And you as a customer who purchased food from any restaurant, even if it's food in Tamiz, you're entitled to take the leftover. No one can tell you, no, no, this is our leftover. We you have to leave it behind. We don't have containers. You will almost never find this. Everyone is, even if they look at you funny, because they're not used to this, especially if there's only a little bit left, you know, uh, uh, one bite of hummus and three french fries which you can't eat anymore they look at you like are you serious you really want me to pack this to go yes please pack it to go take away and as soon as you leave the restaurant very often you won't even make it to the car before you find someone out there who looks like he is in need and as soon as you give him the food they are happy that they have received some food so now you got the edge of not throwing away food and the edge of giving away food and so many things and it didn't cost you any extra money. But why do so many people ignore this? It's, it's amazing. It's one of the easiest things to do. And you know, it, push comes to shove, yarhamukallah. Push comes to shove, anyone at the traffic light, any of these masakeen, sometimes this really shows you who's the real miskeen and who's not. In my case, personally, I've given food to people who told me, no, I want money. And that tells you, if, if you're a miskeen, if you're a beggar, can you have conditions also? <laughs> yani you give a beggar a pair of shoes, Wallah, Nike, I don't wear Nike, Adidas. <laughs> yani, ma ba'rif ya sheikh, yani. You, yani. you get a place, conditions, of my, my you need, then this is what I have available, let's, let's work it together. Someone will come and tell you, miskin, 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 you give him food, say, I don't need food. If you're a miskin, your habibi, you will take anything. A miskin takes anything. I mean, this happened in, in Ramadan, in Zakatul Fitr. It's not like I had, maybe he, he doesn't like to eat after someone, f fair enough. He has his own, uh, you know, reasons. But if you're giving someone rice and beans and, and pasta and what have you, still wrapped, you just bought it from the supermarket, and someone is telling you, Wallahi, my children, um, Idris, the whole shebang, and then you give him food, he says, no, 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 I need money. Say, Akhi, what type of miskin are you? If you're a miskin, you will need this food. So when you give people food, you really know who needs it and who's just playing around. They will take it, the real miskin will take it. Then maybe you want to give him money afterwards, Jazakallah khair. Huh? You feel that this person at least was receptive enough because you can tell from the reaction sometimes whether they're happy with this uh, meal you gave them or not. Al Muhim. Then we go into many areas uh, where, you know, uh, Sufyan al Thawri, for example, he said, he said, the best place for my heart was in Mecca and Medina because there I was with people who were regular people, you know, that no one knew and no one knew me. So I was like a, I was a regular person among them. He didn't get this special attention. So this was the best place for his heart to be rectified from all the fitna of being famous and so on and so forth. Because Sufyan al-Thawri was Sufyan al-Thawri. I mean, Sufyan al-Thawri, Sufyan al Uyayna, these people were at the level of Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah and the, the a'imma of the madhahib. But their madhab, some of them had a madhab of their own, it just did not remain 
Allah did not decree that it will remain popular afterwards. But they had their own position, their own stances on many of these issues that were variant to the existing opinions of Shafi'i, Hanafi, uh, Hanbali and Maliki. Just making sure you remember the four Imams. al muhim So if we were to uh, continue to enumerate what the Salaf had, then we will feel more bad about ourselves. So what we want to do then is introduce these things in segments. We will deal, we dealt with some of the things pertaining to their sincerity and their reliance upon Allah. And we will deal in the future about their character, something that we can benefit from tremendously, how diplomatic they were. And really that is the key word. And I'm not trying to be political right now. And when you hear diplomatic, you think of politics. That's not what I mean. But a, a person who thinks this way is a person who, know, he, who knows how to manage the conflicts he may have with others in the most efficient way. Because you may have a lot of conflicts in life with your mudir, with your colleague, with the neighbor, with so many things may happen in one's life that will create a bunch of barriers between them and the people. And so we will learn from the Salaf how they dealt with these situations. And, and we will also learn that sometimes, instead of reacting in a very bad way, reacting in a... And I learned a lesson yesterday. You know, some people have no consideration. We, I was in Riyadh, and uh, we parked the car in, in, in one spacious parking area. And some guy, mashallah, tabarakallah, was very considerate about fellow Muslims. He parked his car so close, huh? to the car where we were, that the person, يعني, even if he were a snake, he can't go in to open his own door. You know, and we're both standing there like, like how would you go in? How, am I gonna, how is he going to go in to open a door for me to or go from the passenger door? Because I'm not driving, he's driving. And the guy had space, even if he didn't have space. A rational Muslim would do what? Don't park there, ya If you saw that the space is tight, you park or you don't park? You don't park. Park elsewhere and walk. Instead of knowing that you will block this person so much so that they cannot enter their car. Or they will have to enter from the passenger side. And then they have to jump. V many people have ripped their pants <laughs> trying to do this. Huh? You have a shaft, you know, the gear and all types of the handbrake, all types of stuff. By the time you try to move over, man, you may never make it to the other side except with an injury or ripped sober pants. It's not a really a cool thing, you, you enter, it's like you're stealing your own car. People see you all going from the passenger door, and you close the door behind you. And just, I had to do it a few times, like, what is this? Why am I doing this? So I was telling the guy, you know, someone can easily punish this person by doing what? By squeezing himself like a snake, get into the door and bam! You know, three, four times until you scratch the heck out of his car and bend it a few times so he can learn a lesson. Right? I mean, you may feel it's justifiable. Wallahi, you've oppressed me, this is dhulm. I'll give you a, a piece of your own medicine, a taste of your own medicine, I'll show you dhulm. And so you go and do this. And the guy, you know, mashallah, tabarakallah, very subtle brother. Of course, I was saying this, no, I wasn't advising him to do this. I was telling him that this is something that someone may do and feel that it's justifiable. He said, why? Why would someone do this? It's a couple of minutes. Of, of trouble and uh, khalas. you get in the car you drive away and it's gone and I was like how cool is that and he did it he got from the passenger door and jumped onto the other side get in the car and open the door you know I went and we moved and khalas, it was done now I thought of all the potential drama that could have happened had that per had he done that and then who comes at the moment he's banging the door the owner of the other car yeah sheikh what are you doing wallah you blocked me I was up and you know how many people died like this? You know how many people die because of these fights that begin with like, he has a knife in the car or a gun. They keep fighting until, wallahi, one stabs another one, who shoots another one. If, if this happens all the time, not only in, in other countries, even in Saudi. These things happen. Now they have become a, a, a common occurrence in certain areas where people, you know, lose their life over a fight. School fight, college fight, work at work, a doctor with the patient. The, the, a man here not that long ago went into the doctor and shot the doctor because when he fixed his teeth, he didn't put enough of that uh, anesthesia or something. 
he hurt him so much, wallah, he went and shot the doctor. يعني انت يسي اخي خلاص يا اخي The pain is gone, hella, and it's over. You go shoot the guy, kill him, and end his life, then you get killed in the process because you killed the SO. Yani, how crazy can we get? Very crazy. Where do you learn how to relax? From the Salaf. They were so cool with these things. They just know how to handle it and keep things nice and cool. Add patience, perseverance, all types of traits which we will discuss in the future, inshallah ta'ala. So like I said, the objective is that we try to emulate them as much as possible and realize that it is about loving those individuals and this will make you love them. I personally, when you read this, you say, Wallahi, I can only love a, I can only love a person like this. Imagine if you were living amongst us right now, in our midst, someone like that, you know? So this love, we hope from Allah Azza wa Jal will be means for us to be with them in the life to come. So inshallah, we'll have uh, more sessions of the golden chains and how they were. Uh, so we can become like them. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد. Any questions related to the subject? Wa alaikum salam, sir. Loving a person makes him go closer to him. Makes him go closer to him. Time out, I'm not understanding you. If you love a person, he will go closer to himself? No, like people say they love the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, Alice, okay. They, they don't follow, they just don't, don't follow, they don't pray. Like, yeah, yeah, Shaykh, I love, uh, I love Allah, I love the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but still, you know, I can't pray. I hear what you're saying. We discuss. You said that the, the love can, you know, sometimes. Yeah, the, the love with the proper aqidah. The love with shortcomings. Uh, not the love with, uh, which is a hypocritical love. Because there, there are two different things. Meaning, someone can claim to love Allah and His Messenger, and even what's easily doable, they don't do. That's just, that's just bluffing. Right? That's just bluffing. Um, yet, we say it's a matter of the heart. And the, uh, the general condition is that we don't enter into people's heart and judge what's in there. But we say this, this contradicts their claim of love. And there are things like the Sahabi, who does not necessarily have a lot of voluntary acts. Mind you, he did not leave the obligation because we're talking about halal and haram or obligatory and prohibited versus recommended and makruh. You may love the Messenger of Allah sallam, but not be able to leave all the makruh alone and don't do all the mustahabbat. But, but you're justifying your love by following the ayah. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ You're following him. Versus someone who's completely disregarded the Prophet ﷺ, but he tells you that he loves him. Then that becomes, uh, between him and Allah, it's an issue now. Because that love is not justifiable. Why? Prayer. Who cannot pray five times a day? Seriously. No one can give you a real excuse. Allah, I'm busy, ya akhi, the issues of the dunya, I feel because... It's all excuses, really. Salah, for example, there's no, no excuse. You didn't pray the nafila, you didn't pray Qiyam al layl okay, akhi, mash. Your love of the Messenger of Allah, inshaAllah, will help you out. But you couldn't pray to Allah, period, and you love Allah and His Messenger, come on. See what I'm saying? So it's about halal and haram and obligations and recommendations. You said about masajid having salah and prayer in there Of course, your salah there is invalid. Invalid. You cannot pray in a masjid which has a, a qabr or a grave or a dead man in it or whatever they have built there. Any construction around it, the salah there is invalid. Because it's not a graveyard, it's a masjid. Whoa, we haven't had one of those in so long. I don't believe it. MashaAllah, you talked about hiding our good deeds. Should we celebrate or acknowledge our children when they finish memorizing just to encourage them because other uh, throw parties for worldly achievements and we want to show that for this achievement is higher? Y yes, but there's no conflict here. Because here the child, I don't know if he's speaking about on, on your behalf or behalf of the child. If it's on your behalf, meaning you're tr worried about whether you should hide this from the people or not, then we say you weigh them out. For a child at that age, 
what matters to them? Are they going to understand all these matters of sincerity at their intricate level? No, they're not. What will encourage them to memorize more Quran? Giving them incentives. Incentives. So we say, no, you, you do something like this. You do encourage them, you do make it known, you, you give them that boost so they can continue going in that path. If you feel that you're doing it just so that the people can praise you and your children, and you're not really trying to make your children happy to do more, then don't throw any party. Call it off and call it a day. So we assume, all of us, if, if we knew our children had done, achieved something in the memorization of the Qur'an, any type of event would be to be an incentive for them. Because when I give him a gift, uh, I buy him a, a remote control car or whatever a child wants, I've rewarded him for his effort. Is he going to memorize more? Usually, yes. If I disregarded his effort, then there's nothing that will interest him because at that age, they cannot comp even us, we fail in comprehending the issues of sincerity. And of course, uh, they, I could have quoted those, but the time didn't allow. I didn't want to really take too long in this lecture. But there are statements of the Salaf about Talab al ilm He said that we were seeking knowledge for other than Allah. It was just our parents told us, learn, memorize. And they weren't doing this for Allah. He said, Ab Allah. Allah refused, except that it would be for His sake, at the end. Meaning they spent years as children growing up, learning, learning, memorizing, but they weren't doing it for Allah, like you know, a, a, a grown man or a grown woman would think. They were children. They, yes, their parents taught them, and don't do it for the people, don't show up. But a child cannot comprehend this very well. When they became older, the knowledge they had gained, they learned sincerity. They understood sincerity, then Allah made the same knowledge they acquired for whatever reason become the reason why they were sincere. So that's how you deal with children. They're not going to understand these issues very well. So you give them incentives and you encourage them, inshallah. Yes, it's better than throwing a party for some, you know, someone becoming a doctor. Sorry for those who threw a party for their children becoming doctors. I'm just saying. A juz is more important, I believe. Yes, sir. Define open bid'ah. Yeah, no, imam, define. Like uh, he reads salam before the adhan. And then, uh, he reads salam before the adhan? Yeah, like Barilvi, you know. Barilvi, the, the imam is of that sect. Malish, explain more. Because m not everyone may understand. What does he read salam before adhan? Uh, that means, uh, you know, people think uh, the Prophet is made from the nur of Allah. Okay. They praise uh, the Prophet just like Allah, they think they're both are equal. So that bid'ah, and then he and you saw him do all of that. Yeah, we know that he's, he's, he's doing the rubbish. But the locality is having masjid in, like far away. So all masjid are far. Only one masjid is we have in that area. So can you pray behind that imam? Look, the, the fundamental principle is that you pray behind the local imam of your masjid until you have solid proof based on knowledge that you possess that what he's doing is something that is extremely deviant, taking him out of Islam. If he does some bid'ah, for example, the imam turns around after the salah and he raises his hand, make communal dua. He makes dua with the rest of the congregation. And they all say, I mean, then he wipes his face in the whole nine yards, right? You don't stop praying behind this imam because of this, because you can easily, after the taslim, sit down and say, Subhanallah, 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 and ignore him. You don't have to do the dua with him. And it doesn't justify that you stop praying in the masjid because of that bid'ah. But if it's what you're saying, he told you, I believe the messenger of Allah is equal to Allah. Because that's what you said. Man, you cannot make that assumption based on his actions. You have to, it's a very, very delicate matter, Akhi. And this is something that happens to a lot of the youth. They, they were living, you know, they were Diobandis or Baralvis or whatever. Then suddenly they learn about the Aqidah. Then they start doing wholesale takfir of everyone in the community. Oh, this Imam is a kafir and my uncle is a kafir and my aunt is a kafir and my father is a kafir. And I go, yeah, yeah, Sheikh, calm down. They all believe this. They all be did you speak to each one of them and they told you they believe this? Yeah, Sheikh, did you have enough knowledge to refute them that they were wrong and they refused? No. Then calm down. Actually, what happens here is what he's saying is that in this masajid, the Quran also coming from the same background. Before the Adhan, there is like. No, wait, before you explain to me, sir, I, I, I'm going to let you, don't worry, but. I'm dealing with principles because I'm not this India as an example. Now you may prove to me because you know his locality or you know these sub that what he's saying is valid. 
But I'm, I'm given a general reminder not to rush into doing this takfir on the Muslims. So this is a very delicate matter that we have to have some reservation in regards to. Once proven to be what you may explain to me in the next couple of minutes, then we will say, okay, the shaykh can tell him, you don't pray in this masjid because this imam is marra khalas, ta'ban. And then you pray at home or you drive to another masjid. So now you can uh, tell us. Basically, it's not just about one imam or one masjid. It's about general belief of respect to self, you know, which is prohibited. And that belief, like, you know, there are kinds, the book of the Rakhida, I say, that all risk in the world is distributed from the hands of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is their basic Akhida. And apart from that, what they... And they all believe that. Each Barelvi believes that. It's part of the aqidah. Okay. Aqida. Apart from that, uh, when the Imam gives this, when the Muslim gives Adhan, this was the Adhan, he says, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum wa alaikum which was never a part of Adhan, even we have not heard in our childhood. Naam. Massages. Naam. Secondly, in their massages, uh, I, have, I have read, you know, Ashara. So I remember one Ashara. Uh, it said, Allahu Rabbu Muhammad wa Nahnu Abdu Muhammad. Huyo. This is, this is written in the masjid. So now, how can we pray behind this people? I didn't say pray. Exactly. <laughs> so, secondly, you know, second, second problem that we face is that if we go to these masajids, then, you know, our children, fine, for us, we know what is wrong. No. But then, you know, we have the fear of our children picking up things which we have been living with and which we have come out of. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm not telling you to go there. I was saying, uh, because he's young, we don't know what is it that he has seen. And now you're explaining to us some very serious things which maybe a lot of us don't know. Once all of these that you mentioned as an example apply to these different masajid that may be asked about, then we will all say don't go there. Because this is, this is kufr. Uh, he said in Arabic, I don't know if you understood, gentlemen. He said, Allah is the Lord of Muhammad and we are the slaves of Muhammad. If it says that, khalas, done deal. Uh, so if, if it's like that, then obviously you do not go and you do not pray behind such an imam. But is that the case in every masjid in India, every masjid in Pakistan, every masjid in, in Lebanon or whatever where we have these type of belief systems? No. So we want to be careful of you know, painting everyone with the same brush. Once confirmed that it is at that level of deviance, then uh, you know, khali wali as they say. But if it is not, then we don't want to encourage wholesale or stop going to the masjid and go only to the masjid, which is, you know, the, your own people. And then that creates more, uh, you know, division. Sometimes that is not justifiable. Sometimes it's justifiable, sometimes it's not. So we just have to be careful. But thanks for the information. That's traumatizing, actually. But Elvis, huh? One of them refuted me, one of their uh, popular shuyukh in the UK. Yeah? He, uh, they made a video where he, they asked him, I, I told you about this, they said you cannot pray behind the Imam of the Haram. If you pray behind the Imam of the Haram, you will get uh, 100,000 uh, sins. Because he said good deeds are multiplied in the Haram, and because the Imam of the Haram is Wahhabi, so you will get 100,000 bad deeds. He said, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, Allah, Atik al Allah, Shaykh Kabir, Allah. Yeah, 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 we know. But inshallah, the, uh, the Islamic awakening is taking place. A lot of these people are seeing the light, while a lot of them have now. We make dua for them that Allah Azza wa Jal guides us and guides them to the truth, you know. It's, but it's, it's our job to give them da'wah. Really, it's our effort. And if, we don't, if we're not gentle, I mean, I blame myself a lot in the past. And a lot of people, you, you kind of learn as, as time goes by. Maybe sometimes we're so upset with them that we scare them away. And we have to kind of win them over. And then when it's a hopeless case, then we can scare them away. But before that, maybe we should make some more decent attempts to try to you know, create bridges so that we can communicate the message to them properly. Yes, sir. I, I, I remember that there was a fatwa about this on Islam QA. I don't remember the answer, honestly. So, but you'll find it on islamqa.info. 
and then share the answer with us next time, inshallah. Yes, sir. What a cozy Q&A session. No, it's okay, I'm happy. <laughs> Full of bid'ah, huh? That's a nice one. Eid Milad? Mawlid, Mawlid. Yeah, it's not called Eid Milad. In Arabic, is your birthday. Like any person's birthday. Mawlid is the Prophet's birthday, alayhi salam, supposedly, yeah. He only celebrates the Mawlid? Everything what? If the same thing we mentioned, we're back to square one. Again, we don't want to assume that he's doing A, B, C, D, F, G until we have seen, until we have proven. If he only celebrates the Mawlid, no. Khalas, then it's the same question. The, my answer, copy paste. Why do you have to wait for him? You don't even go to the masjid. Don't go to the masjid. The environment is so, so taban. Traveling, ya Sheikh, you have the biggest excuse on planet earth not to pray in the masjid. You pull over the car anywhere and pray anywhere. Khalas, jama' qasr and your life is good to go. Don't go visit these masjid. Man, you may get beat up, never make it out of the masjid. Khalas? Alrighty then. So we'll see you inshallah next time. TBD. Hopefully, what is these sounds? Hopefully in January inshallah, huh? We will be back to the monthly, monthly lecture inshallah. Once a month minimum uh, lecture inshallah. So hopefully in January we'll have our lecture. You'll get the update on, on the Facebook page or SMS or however you get it.